Ladies and gentlemen, to begin this morning's keynote session, please welcome PCBC board member and past president, Ms. Sandra Colley. I'm thrilled to see so many people here. It's uh, gonna be an incredible presentation. Um, last night, I was coming home from Knob Hill and I took a cab, because I had on high heels and I couldn't walk down the hill, because I'm an aging boomer. And I was struck by the cab driver who said to me, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here for PCBC. And he said, oh, I was there. I said, what do you mean? Five years ago, I laid floors. Remember when the conference was in three different halls? Now you know we're in a tough business when the guy driving you home used to be in it, and now he's driving a cab in San Francisco. So what is it that we can learn this morning that will make us more successful and more profitable and build things that connect to people in stronger ways? I have been reading a lot in the paper, I'm sure you guys have too, how to market to an aging boomer. Flattery, subterfuge, and euphemism. Stephen Jobs said long ago that our marketing starts with the products we design. Wouldn't it be interesting if we could be more like the Apple Store, where people crowded in to get what we had designed and created, instead of using flattery, subterfuge, and euphemism? Well, here's the good news. You're going to learn about amazing design that you can put in your homes and in your communities. Joe Coughlin, our speaker this morning, has a really cool job. He works with a whole lot of very smart people at MIT. He gets to travel around the world to places like France and Singapore and even Alberta, Canada. And he thinks about life tomorrow. Joe started, he's the founder, and he runs the MIT Age Lab. Here's what it says on their webpage. Their work is inspired by the belief that the creative use of technology, combined with an understanding of human behavior, will lead to innovations in living and ignite the changes necessary to realize 100 years of quality living. Wouldn't you like to have that? So if you take a look at their website, which is agelab.mit.edu, you'll see Joe and his team driving Miss Daisy, which is a darling yellow VW Beetle that lives at the lab. Or you'll see Agnes and people wearing Agnes. I don't know if any of you saw this in the Sunday Times, but Agnes stands for Age Gain Now Empathy System a suit that will make you feel like you're 74 years old, even if you're 45. Nothing like empathy for design. So what does all this mean to us, people who design homes and design communities? The first of 76 million boomers turned 65 in January. We know there's a huge market out there for us. There's a lot to learn from Joe and his team about innovations for how we will live and work and play tomorrow. Let's get started. Joe? It's a beautiful day. That was a great intro. Thank you very much. Really, thank you very much for being here. I'm really happy to be invited out here to California, given the fact that it's 51 degrees and raining in Boston. So this is a, a, a great opportunity to meet all of you and to enjoy some of the sunny weather out this way. Um, Sandra gave a great intro as to some of the things I'll be touching on, but she also used a word that I'm very fond of, and it's, it's quite hot right now, but we should think more about it, and that is innovation. And really when we start thinking about what innovation is, it's not just about new ideas, but it's really understanding how to put new ideas into practical use that respond, if you will, to the jobs of the consumer. And what I hope to describe for you today is a story a story about how people are starting to age and live, but how they will live tomorrow, and how that might impact the future of home design, community design, and even touch a little bit on, on retail as well. So I invite as we go along, if somebody's got a question, you can interrupt, or if you want to, if we wait toward the end, we can have questions, uh, bad jokes, whatever works for you. Uh, my students uh, designed this uh, slide that you see that is the cover slide. Um, I think I'm quite fond of it. It usually gives me a sense of security that there'll be at least one other person with my haircut, but I see a few guys over here that clearly go to the same barber shop I do. So let's talk, let's talk about what I like to frame as disruptive demographics. 
Um, some of you may have read a number of years ago a book by Clay Christensen, a great scholar at the uh, uh, art school up the river from us. What's it called? Oh, yeah, Harvard. Um, and he wrote a book about disruptive innovation that said, you know, certain technologies come along that totally blow up your business model. And so the classic example, of course, is the PC and how the PC totally blew up those folks that were sellers of mainframes. And in fact, one popular quote of uh, folks that ran digital was, you know, who the heck would want a computer on their desk? Well, we now know the, the history and where that went. But technology does not just disrupt your business alone. It does not change the assumptions that quite often you've gotten very good at and very comfortable with. It, people change your business as well. Did anyone see this article in the Fortune magazine not too long ago? What are the two things we can say we depend on in life, we can depend upon? By the way, class participation is 10% of your grade. <laughs> death and taxes. Well, taxes, yes. Death, not so much. Because imagine this, the funeral home industry, and I know we all feel sorry for them, um, are lamenting that we're not dying at the rate we used to die at. And as a result, they're not making plans. So I saw a few of you grabbing the Danish out there. Apparently, you're willing to do your part. Um, <laughs> the fact is, is that the new disruptive demographics of an aging society is not just about the numbers of older adults that we're going to be seeing. In fact, last year, the Lancet, the medical journal, came out and said 50% of babies born today in the industrialized world will probably live to 100 and beyond. But it's not just about the numbers. It's not just about how old you are. What I want to make a case for today is that there's a leading edge of older adults that are now the lifestyle leaders in housing, in retail, in how we use land use and the like in a way that we never thought older people would be like because they have the numbers, they have the expectations, and frankly, even with the economic downturn, they still have got more discretionary income than anyone else out there. Remember these guys? Uh, by the way, we might as well get this out of the way. As we all, many of you may know, the baby boomers are in between, born between 1946 and 64. Would all of you born in that period please raise your hand? Please look at the people who did not raise their hand because they're thinking one of two things. I wish you would just go away or you just stop and shut up. The fact is, is that this is not just the largest generation, it is also the loudest. And they are now turning one every seven seconds roughly, they're turning 65. That means an entire nation of Floridas. So next time you're backing up in a parking lot, think about that. <laughs> this is the last numbers chart I'm going to show you. It is the only one you should ever focus on as a matter of business unless you're a real numbers geek. The fastest growing part of the population is 85 plus. Then there's a dip, and then you see the baby boomers rise. But for all of you that are banking on Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, Gen whatever the, the letter is assigned to it, note the following. There is at least a five, if not 15 year drop in the population behind the baby boomers. So that means businesses of all types, be it health, auto, housing, retail, all of these businesses are finally realizing after 60 years of perennial youth coming into their market and into their workforce, they're realizing, oh my God, we have to hold on to these people longer than we ever did before simply just to stay where we are. We know the so-called red queen effect from Alice in Wonderland. We now have to run faster and faster just to stay in place. So don't wait for the young market. You have to create the new today to excite and delight the older customer with the idea that also by exciting and delighting them, not to design something for an old man or an old woman, because by the way, I don't know if you know this, if you design anything for an older person, I can guarantee two things. One, a younger person won't buy it, and neither will an older person. And so as a result, you now have to start thinking about how do I keep that market, and how do I make it age less to go to the next slope over? So if you talk to companies like Nissan, they're already acknowledging it. You know, the average customer for a Z car. Now, you remember in the 1970s, Nissan did not have very good luck with their metal and, and the like, but they had great and elegant design. Now they have elegant design, and they've actually got good technology as well. But they know that the guys who couldn't afford the Z car when they were in their 20s and teens are now buying them in large numbers now. The average age, mid-50s. Average age of BMW, even if you include the, the, the more affordable mark, uh, models, 55. Cadillac, anyone want to take a guess? Close to 70, they've worked hard to get that Cadillac to have a zig. It's now down to 67. And so as a result, when you think about high tech, high price, and high style, it is not the 20-year-old kid, because his parents may be buying it for him, but it's actually the 50-plus that's actually buying the product. 
So these folks are not just getting older. They've got greater expectations. You know, this is a survey that was done not too long ago that basically asked the 50 plus the following. What do you want to do? What do you hope to do, say maybe, you know, by age 80 or whatever it might be? Hoping to continue to learn, study, and travel? Volunteer, you know, remaining engaged? Part-time work with the economic downturn, those numbers are even increasing more, as you might imagine. See no serious limitations on activity at age 70. You know something? They're probably right. Active and going strong at age 80. Hope it shows their parents well. And expect treatments of ills for aging to improve. And that expectation, you should not just write that off as saying that's for the pharmaceutical industry. That's the new generation gap. You know, it is no longer about how old you are and who you trust and like, but the real generation gap now that the baby boomers are the leading edge of is Generation X, that is Generation Expectation. Tomorrow will be better because there will be a product, there will be a service, there will be a design to make it possible for me to be able to manage my disease, provide care, be more engaged, work part-time, or frankly, simply just go out and have an ice cream cone with a grandchild. But tomorrow will be better because frankly, for the past 60 to 65 years, as the loudest, and I dare say maybe even the most spoiled generation, we have seen technology come and go. We have seen institutions change, not just under our own tutelage, but just the natural progression of innovation in real time. And so, as we think about what is that face of the baby boomer, I don't want you to just think about a birthday. There's a few characteristics that you really should think about that are more qualitative that go into that profile of this 70 to 80 million strong group. Now, by the way, I'm making a mistake if you believe that when I, I'm trying to capture 80 million people to be all of one thing. No, that's not the case. There's great variation within that. And offline, we can certainly talk about what those variations are between younger boomers and uh, later boomers. But I would suggest to you that if you start to do serious research in this area, you've got to cut it down into five-year cohorts and go that way. But there are some generalizations that I'm willing to share with you. One, they're healthier. And I'm not going to talk about disease in terms of they're, not, they're going to be absent of disease. I'll get to that in a moment and how that may impact your business. Secondly, whether they are or are not, they believe they are more informed. They've certainly got more college education, and I can show you any number of examples in Cambridge of people with college education that does not necessarily mean that they're smart, but they believe they're informed. Smart income. Yes, we all took a hit economically. There's a new value out there. It's not just about how much money I have. It's about how I spend it. Uh, gentlemen. All the men in the room, please raise your hand. Why don't you go and have another cup of coffee someplace? Because frankly, aging is not about you. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to why this is probably going to be very depressing for you shortly. Um, providing care. Our parents are living longer. Our spouses are living longer. And frankly, the guys that just raised their hand are going to be a burden to the women sitting next to them. Aging in place. This is the big, this is, goes right to the core of your business. The vast majority of folks want to live where they live today by age 50 or so. Working longer, both by choice and necessity. And a data point that I think few of us have really thought about in recent years. Aging is becoming a home alone experience. So let's get into this. The future of health. I've got good news for you and not so good news for you. The good news is you're all going to be living longer. But you're going to be ill. But not sick. Am I playing games with language? In part. 110 million Americans today already have one chronic disease. 60 million of us have two, and 20 million of us win the lottery having five chronic diseases. So we're having di disability rates that are actually on the decline, or in some cases, I think the better data coming out of Duke and uh, University of North Carolina are suggesting that disability rates are actually slightly on the decline. But here's the issue. You are going to be having chronic disease to manage, the diabetes high blood pressure, cancer in some categories is now turning into a chronic disease to be treated over time. What you have to ask yourself is, what are the things I'm going to need in clinics, in hospitals, and indeed the number one place that care is provided? The home to manage chronic disease. How has that changed the design of the bathroom, the kitchen, the bedroom, where I provide care? If we think about the population over time, by age cohort, looking across the lifespan, if we measure well-being, these data are from the Gallup Healthways Well-Being Index, we are doing 1,000 surveys per day for 25 years. This is looking at well-being in six dimensions, emotional, physical, mental, and the like. 
Um, all the folks here that are between 37 and roughly 53 to 55 can attest to this. This is the lowest point of well-being according to this chart. You're so stressed between caregiving and kids and work and all the other things that go up through life. But as you look at the baby boom population, particularly the leading edge group, it starts to go up. And what's amazing over time is that apparently older adults are far more resilient than we give them credit for. They know how to cope. So despite disease, despite the medication, despite maybe income pressures and the like, starting at about 53 to 54, you start to have a far more aspirational attitude. You know what they say about, uh, you know, life's too short for, you know, something negative? It's what we call a positivity bias people start to filter out negative information. So selling a product or designing a device or a service about how bad it's going to be doesn't make the sell. Even if, it's, even if it is a real, true fact, it, people after about age 50 start to shut it off. Higher education and tech savvy, this is the generation, if you will, that has doubled the number of people with college educations. The fastest growing part of distance learning as well as going back to college, and we'll get back to this in a moment, around housing, are folks over 50. Not just to go back to take that art history course that your parents wouldn't pay for, but to go back and get a full master's degree in some other field that you now want to enter. And by the way, the fastest growing segment on the internet, despite my 18-year-old daughter and all her friends, are women over 45, and on Facebook, women over 55 and they are profoundly using social media and the web in a very different way. Baby boomers, it is said, do not like to be alone in their own thoughts. They are now using social media, be it Facebook, be it Angie's List, Eons, a number of these platforms that can go on and on, to meet new and often strangers, people, that are like them. Do you know that the most trusted face in America today is no longer an institution, a political figure, a corporation, or even a TV personality? The most trusted person for information when I go to buy a product, a service, or indeed a house is going online to find other people with my level of education, my level of experience, and the, my level of income to say, what do they think about what they're doing? 600 million people on Facebook and the fastest growing group in percent is over the 55 set. So folks are actually using these sites to start thinking about what products do they want to buy that are in the hall down, this, down our hall here. What neighborhoods do I want to go into? What kind of services should I be looking for to be able to age in place? Smart income. Now, this is one of the things that it is, it's very tricky. Many folks like to talk about the economic downturn and how, how it's very hard in the marketplace, and indeed it is. But if you look at home modification, home maintenance, and even new sales, the sales now are still with a 50 plus. And there's a value set that's going on there. It's not just about how much cash may be there or not there. But the new value in the marketplace, particularly for the 45 and 50 plus, is how smart I am. You know, I went to school for a long time. I believe, you know, according to some data that was done number, uh, about two years ago by uh, Yankelovich and, and others, is that 67% of baby boomers believe they have an above average IQ. Think about the math on that. So basically, they have the attitude that, frankly, if I need brain surgery, I could do it myself, but I don't have the time, so I'll let you do it. So now what they want to do is they want to make every purchase a testament to how smart I am. So if I go to Walmart, does anyone know what the name of the TV network is in Walmart? It's the Smart TV Network. If I go into Whole Foods, now I go into Whole Foods because I can hire a navigator to help me eat well, but have a navigator of the store help me to eat cheaply but smartly. And Costco, how many of you go to a big box store like a Costco or something like that? You know, be honest what you want to go in there for. It's not just the, the, what you want to buy in bulk. It's not just the price. In fact, they make most of their money off of people what they call treasure hunting. They're buying, you know, they go in for cat food and they go, oh, wow, I really do need a Bose stereo. It's like, it's, but what they do is they grab that stereo and they run out to the parking lot like this and they jump into either their Ford 150 or their Porsche. Both markets are parked right next to each other because both enjoy the following. They enjoy getting a good price. They enjoy getting it cheap, but they enjoy the fact that, you know, this is a Bose. I, I, I got this at a good, good price. It was not about saving the money. It was, no, I, I did my homework. It's about how smart I can be. How smart can you make your customer? Speaking of smart, this is where the guys should leave. Um, my wife has been telling me this for years, but now I have empirical evidence. Uh, women are in charge of the vast majority of decisions that we're, we're thinking about in the future. And that the new demands of older women, particularly older boomer women, are going to change every single marketplace out there. They are now more educated in all fields, if you count degrees as education, 
except engineering, and they're quickly picking up on that. They are a new generation of workforce. At least 70% are in the workforce, at least part-time, if not full-time. And frankly, they are the home CEO. So if you talk to Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, the folks that use those cabinets and all the other things that you put into homes and in retail stores, they know that 80 cents to 90 cents on the dollar of decision-making is being made by that woman. And by the way, if you look at your more recent home modification and home improvement data, she's pulling the trigger on that as well. So he may be going in with a tool belt to Home Depot or talking to the contractor, but at the end of the day, she's the one that's choosing what the color is, what the product is, and by the way, why isn't it done fast enough? She's living longer than men, and she's providing the majority of care. By the way, not just for herself, not just for a husband that probably can't make a peanut butter and jelly, but probably for her parents, and if he does not have an older, uh, older sister, for her parent, his parents as well. The number one caregiver out there is the oldest, oldest daughter who's averaging about 57 years old. Let me tell you the trajectory of the difference between men and women. You, ne you needed to hear from some geek from MIT that, that boys and girls are different, right? Um, if you look at the gerontology literature, the following seems to be happening out there. One is that as women age, well, let me actually start with this. As men age, starting at about 50 and sadly by about 60, not only do we, quote, slow down, but we start to turn a little bit inward. Now, I'll give a little story like this. Uh, let's say it's a relatively affluent house and they play golf and the like. How many of you play golf, by the way? I agree with Mark Twain. It's a good walk ruin. I'm sorry. But I'll use golf as an example anyway. Is Where's dad upon retirement? Dad's out on the golf course. A couple of years later, maybe even less, where's dad? Dad's working in the yard. Where's dad? Dad's in the garage. Where's dad? Now, my, you know, my parents are from upstate New York. No one knows what this means, but we always say it. Where's dad? He's puttering in the basement. Where's dad? He's on the couch. Where's dad? He's gone. Age 50. Take a woman at age 50. Do you know who's starting all the new companies these days in the United States and Northern Europe? It's not the 25-year-old kid that's one of my students with a new widget. No. Believe it or not, women over 50 are starting brand new organizations, particularly service companies. So if she's not working part-time, or starting a company, she's taking care of grandchildren, she's going to the book club, she's going out, she's going here, she's going there, and as the cartoon indicated on the slide, basically as my dad comes home and tries to find a place on the couch, she looks after 30, 40 years of marriage going, I don't know who this guy is on my couch, and he's talking about us, well frankly, you figure out us while I go out because I've already got a life. So you've got this conflict now in the home of women as they age get a second and third burst of energy, whereas men, they come home to retire. Now that may change, but so far we don't see it. This is not your mother's marketplace. Not only are women more active, but they're also certainly earning more money than they've ever had before. But if you look at where the, where the houses are being bought, they're buying homes at twice the rate. The financial services industry are looking at these folks, home modification, and certainly construction. Now the one part I did not quite understand, 80% of NFL products are sold to women. Wow, that's a lot of sweatshirts, footballs, and whatever else it might be. And caregiving. This is a thing that is going to not just impact personal lives and financing and emotion, but it also is going to shape the future of how we look at houses and what we buy in retail. Do you know that one in four American families today already spend upwards of 21 hours per week caring for an older adult? That can be as simple as taking dad to get a haircut. That means my girls won't have to do that as much. Uh, it could be checking in on mom to make sure she took her blood pressure meds, having mom move in with her to make sure that she's eating right and getting dressed and the like. That in terms of lost productivity in the workplace, we're talking about $32 billion has been estimated to be lost because largely working women cannot or choose not to take a job that requires them to move or to travel a lot. They come to work late, leave early, or take long lunch breaks to look in on mom and dad. And by the way, caregiving is going to get far more complex than we ever thought before because we're now likely to have far more parents than we ever had children. And given the pace of divorce, by the way, divorce rates have doubled since 1992 with people over 50 initiated guys, again, initiated more often by the woman. Aging in place. This is data that has just come out today with my partners at the Hartford uh, Life Insurance uh, Company, a project we did on aging in place. As many of you already know, by the time you're 50, in general, your marriage, your mortgage, and your memories are in the house that you live in. You've got to have an exceedingly compelling reason to move. The three things we identify, the reason why people want to age in place, is the perception that family is nearby, and many of the baby boomers won't have to worry about that because they had far fewer children, so the idea that family is nearby may not be the case unless it's a caregiving responsibility. Second, 
They're used to the comfort they have. And third, just the perceived cost of what that move might be. So you need to create not just a new design, a new community, but a compelling alternative to what they already know that is within those parameters. You know that 70% of Americans live in suburban and rural areas that are over age 50? This means there's a very different way of looking at connectivity, a new way of how to think about design and certainly transportation. And by the way, even before the economic downturn, less than 10% of the retirees that we all spoke of that moved to Sun and San ever moved. And when they did, as soon as one of the partners got sick, or worse, they boomeranged back to wherever they believed they had the strongest social network. And guys, this is what the future looks like in terms of the future of work. We're working longer, yep, in part because of income, challenge, but now as we start thinking about where we're going to live and how we're going to live, Retirement at age 60, 65, even 67 is not what we thought it was going to be. It's more likely to have a very flexible life where you're going to be working in and out of the workforce with different things that you're doing and, frankly, even different careers. Small. The future, as I see it, is getting much smaller. This is what I find is striking. 40%, and depending on the group you look at, as much as 42% of women over 65 live alone. If you back that number down to 60, 30% of folks over 60 live alone. The world just got much smaller than we ever thought of. So whether it's empty nesters or single child households, those are becoming dominant, but the idea of a household of one is the new thing we have to start thinking about. We also have to start thinking about the diminished physical cap capacity of people as they age in place. So I'm not going to get into the discussions around universal design and doorknobs and handles and lighting so much. You've already got that handle. The Na National Association of Home Builders, AARP, have got splendid guidelines in that area. But the idea is to create environments that are simple, elegant, and easy to navigate. Much the way, if you look at the shopping cart that's up on the, on the slide there, the, shopping, the fastest growing selling shopping cart are the small shopping carts. That's not just because we have smaller stores, but because frankly, do you remember, you know, this shows my age, do you remember Kramer on Seinfeld buying the tuna fish can that was this big? Well, if you're living by yourself, you don't need that many things. The question is, what do you need in the house to support households of one? And so if you think of who's paying attention to this, the impact on retail is certainly profound. So in fact, Walmart, among others, is now starting to experiment with smaller format stores. Now, yes, they're trying to fit them into urban areas, but there's also the realization, do you want to, at age 70, to track through 10 acres of parking lot to get to five acres of store when really all you needed was something in the back? So small is not just in the household, but it's also going to be in the retail space. So I could take a number of these trends and, frankly, just take questions now and leave. But, frankly, that'd be a disservice and it wouldn't be any fun. Real strategic insight is not about drawing lines that go straight into the future because the future, uh, as they say, is particularly hazardous whenever you th you're, you're talking about something that is, is unknown. I want you to think about how do these different values or these characteristics of living alone, more women, more older adults, more education, how might that change new businesses, new products, new services that go into the home, that go into the community? So I'm going to share with you maybe what you might consider to be uh, seven hallucinations or visions, depending on your level of kindness this morning. As you can see at MIT, we don't use crystal balls anymore, so we use a computer or so. But what I want you to see is every single thing I'm going to show you is not just new technology, it's actually something that's either here today, or it's someplace around the world, or it will be out within five to ten years. So this is a future look, but it's not that science fiction, if you will. Your retail stores that are around you are not just kind of adjacent partners to a community development or to where you want to develop. They are now the new partner that's going to be in the home. I don't know how many of you have paid attention to say Walgreens is one of the innovators out there. Walgreens now is doing home health care to the house. And I don't mean just delivery, dropping off oxygen tanks or maybe glucose strips or something like that. We're talking about having clinical people or folks that actually come in the home, set up equipment, and provide health care. The retail store is now finding, particularly in pharmacy, finding that they can make more profit off of services than they can move in moving toothpaste and toilet paper.
So as we start thinking about the retail stores around us, what is that going to look like in the shape of how those stores are built in terms of having service provision, clinics within the stores we all know, Ready Clinic, Minute Clinic and the like, but also as they reach into the home. What's that touch point going to be into the house? Do they come into the house? Do they have a place to set up? Do they have a delivery point outside the home to bring in things that may be temperature sensitive, time sensitive, and indeed very private? This is an uh, innovation that we developed with Procter & Gamble in the lab. It uh, takes your personalized diet and allows you to go through the store with a little smart card. Uh, so in my case, it'll uh, say that, gee, Joe, you, know, you grew up in Philadelphia. You believe that uh, cheesecake, uh, I'm sorry, cheesesteaks, Scrapple, and Tasty Cakes. By the way, does anyone know what Scrapple is? You'll live longer if you don't. Um, but you know, to me, those are three basic food groups. So by about age 43, chronic disease starts to kick in. So you take this diet, you put it through there, and you go through the store aisle, and today using barcode, tomorrow using radio frequency identification tags, little computer chips. You swipe it underneath there and it'll say, gee, you've been eating badly, you chose your parents badly, try product B, which is in the same category, but a little healthier. The idea is how to provide information in real time in the retail shelf. By the way, this technology is also now going to be moving to the kitchen because the idea is to be able to provide personalized nutritional choices in real time. And by the way, this technology is already out in Europe. If we start thinking about the way to connect homes, as we're living alone, some of the new technologies are starting to come out there. This is already in the field. We developed it in our lab, is the idea of an e-home service. The kitchen, if you think about it, has always been the social hub. How can we start to redesign the kitchen to provide a social hub that is socially connected electronically? So in this case, we have two touchscreen computers. One is in the home of a friend, family, or typically that adult daughter. One is in the home of the older adult who's living by themselves. And you can share stickies, not just about, gee, mom, did you take your meds? But here's a picture of Johnny at soccer practice. Here's something I did today. Here's a recipe. You know, it's, it's not as strong as you would like. It's not as good as a, a warm hug. But now that families live across regions, let alone across countries, we have to start thinking of ways of now making that kitchen more than just a place to cut vegetables, prepare a meal, but to actually share an experience on a daily basis. So speaking of an experience on a daily basis, how many of you have been to Japan? How many of you have used a smart toilet in Japan? Anyone been attacked by a smart toilet in Japan? I want you to imagine a toilet that's manufactured by Panasonic, Toto, uh, who's out here on the floor today. I want you to imagine a toilet that, and I'm going to keep, because it's close enough between breakfast and lunch that I'll keep it clean, I'll use computer science language, downloads information from you um, regarding your glucose level, your fiber level, uh, you know, uh, the various other things that it can get from that sample, if you will, and then uploads that information computer science, uploads that information via the internet to a call center, say a university hospital in Tokyo, or a disease management center, to be able to manage in real time how well are you? What is your body weight? What is your temperature? Has it changed over time? We're now seeing a profound change of the bathroom and the kitchen, depending on the culture, of being the health station of the future. How do we design in a place in the home that's going to be not just for, gee, Dad, you're sick, you need to have this in the house, but really a wellness area? So this toilet is now being sold for those with chronic disease. It is also being sold already on the market today for what we call the worried well. What you are about to see, whether it's Bill Gates or Panasonic or a number of consumer products out there, are the devices that we put in the home from the refrigerators and appliances and the like are all becoming far more intelligent. Not just in terms of the display that you use to control them, but the connectivity between the appliances that'll talk about, say, your microwave talking to your refrigerator, your refrigerator talking to your toilet, and your toilet talking to your car, so that when you go to the grocery store, or if you don't go to the grocery store, you can have foods delivered that are personalized just for you. I want you to now to start to think about how the home becomes a services platform and not just a place to keep the rain off. So in that spirit, the technology that Panasonic has been working with is much like this little tiger or teddy bear. My daughter having this ongoing argument about it, of whether it's a tiger or teddy bear. But it has a motion sensor on there to make sure that mom got up that day, shall we say. Um, glucose monitor, blood pressure cuff attached to it. And you can plug it into the wall. And the bandwidth that you can get from the electrical outlet has enough internet out, uh, bandwidth to be able to send that information to uh, the hospitals to be able to monitor, make sure that mom and dad are OK. How much do you think it costs? 60? 
30, I heard 300 over here. How about the price free? It's free because what's happening is appliances and all types of devices are becoming commodities. The day I make it and file for IP, it becomes something that gets very easily copied with a few tweaks. And as a result, Panasonic and other companies like that are finding that a strategic alliance, believe it or not, with the local utility company, the local cable company, whoever you bring into the communities that you build and design are now going to become the service providers for health, personal emergency monitoring, and the like. So with Tokyo, in this case, Tokyo Hospital and Tokyo Power and Electric are in team with Panasonic to have these various devices in the home and allowing you to be able to monitor anywhere in the house. This is a, a system that was developed by Comcast, now Xfinity, and Philips. And it was some work that, that we, we had shared a number of years ago with them. But I want you to imagine your own private TV station. Americans are not as big into toys, but we do love our TV. You're going to have your own private TV station that has a set-top box that's going to be able to do all the little things like, you know, give your glucose information, your blood pressure and the like. But it's then going to give you an encrypted private TV station that's going to facilitate maybe a meeting with your doc, a meeting with a nurse, nurse practitioner, remind you to take your meds, and then aggregate across the bandwidth all the television shows that may be of interest to you, given the fact that you're managing type 2 diabetes. And for the guy in the back, that does not mean the food channel. So home services. I don't think that the home of the future is going to be a million, $2 million home. I know that disappoints some of us. But I do think the home of the future is going to be one that is designed around far more services than we've ever imagined. And we have to start thinking about where the places and spaces are within the house to provide these different technologies. So it could be, you know, your underwear has now got sensors, but it's also going to be the smart cabinets, the smart refrigerator, indeed the talking toilets, and a variety of walls that are now starting to come out on the market in Germany and Japan like that are sensing your wellness of that particular day. It may actually change color in real time. And then understanding how does that connect to doctors, emergency response services, and the like. So let's put this to life. Let's put some names attached to it. And all of a sudden, it starts to come to life because you realize a few things. If you talk to Walmart or Procter & Gamble, they want to know when you're almost out of a product before you do. Because their business strategy of just-in-time delivery to Walmart is how they make money. So if I could do that before you actually know it's out of, uh, out of supply in your cabinet or in your bathroom, that'd be a lot better. Who is going to manage these data? Maybe it's going to come to me through the cable company, the power company, but perhaps through Bank of America or through a disease management company like Healthways and connect you to stores that are now hiring nutritionists like grocery stores that are doing home delivery, CVSs and Walgreens that are doing prescription and, and medical compliance about helping your mom remember to take her meds or you taking your meds. So the variety of services overall coming into the home but needing a place to live both in terms of appliance and design. A colleague of mine at MIT is designing the space station's kitchen. Now, imagine this. You don't want to have a kitchen that you have to update on a regular basis, especially if it's a billion dollar renovation. So as a result, one of the things that they're looking at is how do we start looking at adaptive design? So in other words, building the house right from the beginning, realizing that it's going to have to be modular in a sense of plug and play to plug and live. Realizing that this is not just your brand new kitchen that's going to stay there, but something that you don't want to have to gut the house every time you change something. So what we're working on is the idea that perhaps these kitchens, your living room, your family room, whatever it might be, is going to be so modular that when you're tired with an appliance, tired with a wall, tired with a cabinet, you just take that out, literally snap it out, and you snap something else back in. And yes, the robot, robots will be among us. In fact, we already know from my colleagues who developed the company iRobot and the like that we have robots that are cleaning floors, vacuuming floors, cutting lawns and the like. But what you're about to see and already are seeing in Japan and Northern Europe and the like are robots that can be either receptionists or care providers. The little robotic seal you have, you see up there, lives in my lab. It's Paro. It is developed at MIT and is now based a company based in Japan that actually has infrared vision. It recognizes who you are. It responds to your voice, has sensors throughout it, and it has an emotional content, content and contact. The wheelchair you see up there is something we're working on with the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. It's not just your basic electronic wheelchair. That'd be boring. This is a wheelchair that learns your house, learns your store, and learns your neighborhood. So if you say, take me to the kitchen, it'll take you to the kitchen. And by the way, with facial recognition, it says, please find my wife. It'll find my wife wherever it might be. So we're starting to see these technologies wherever they are, in the home, in the store, in the workplace, that are not going to be the robots that we all thought we'd see as kids. 
financial services. It's not just about the design. Remember I started the talk off this morning about innovation being understanding the jobs of the customer? You know, the job of the customer does not end with buying the house. It's the entire process. It's the financing, staying there, the modification and the like. We are now seeing great innovations out there being developed by financial services companies. So for instance, Generali in Europe, which is probably about the third largest insurance company and banking firm in Europe, has developed a, a entire company around long-term care where they're sending nurses to the home to do geriatric workups to see if the house needs to be changed to enable you to age in place. Wells Fargo is now working with some of its more affluent customers to help with bills and administration of the children, of the parents of adult children that happen to be their customers. So we're now starting to look at banks and insurance companies as being a partner, if you will, into what I call purposeful finance. The idea of having specialized products, be they variable annuities or income instruments that provide money solely for home maintenance, solely for home modification, solely to age in place. And we're seeing this with Mitsui. Deutsche Bank had an experiment with something called Time2 to be able to provide and fund the number of services that would be necessary to age in your own home. This is probably one of the greatest innovations I have seen in aging in the last 10 years. And it was not developed by some PhD, it was not developed by a bunch of guys in a lab with white coats and strange glasses. It was developed by a bunch of older adults in Beacon Hill, Mass in Boston, in this Beacon Hill section, that simply had one thing in mind. They wanted to stay home. They wanted to stay in their own neighborhood. And the idea of what they did is they created essentially a co-op, a club that provided transportation services, connections to health care, trash pickup, theater tickets, basically all the things you might need in that thing that we call today assisted living or a reason to move to a 50 plus community. Now, yes, this is a more affluent community. Yes, it's a more efficacious group, but guess what? In a matter of four years, the Beacon Hill Village has now turned into what is known as the Village Movement, and they are in New Zealand. There's two in Washington. They're throughout Europe. The idea that now communities, suburban communities, city communities and the like, are coming together and creating these organizations called villages to outsource the services they need to stay where they are. So when you go to build a development or build a home, would it be wise to have another alternative revenue stream that starts to come out there to be able to organize a village movement so that the job is no longer putting up a structure, make the transaction and leave, but literally to think of the way the auto industry is thinking and a number of other companies that make product like Panasonic that maybe my business is services as much as it is building a building. And as we talk about services, Transportation, you know, we quite often build 50 plus communities and the like where the land is cheaper, where it's more bucolic and the like. This is only Massachusetts data, but I can certainly show you more data from around the country and around the world. When we build retirement communities, and indeed many of us when we choose to quote retire and move, where we move is we have that silent assumption that driving is forever. Now, older drivers are somewhere between humor and horror, but driving may not be forever for many of us. And as a result, this particular study using a, uh, GIS, Geographical Information Systems, we found that less than 50% of homes were within a half mile of anything worth touching, let alone half a mile within public transportation. The new value that people are going to find, particularly baby boomers, as they've been talking to their parents about driving, is going to be connectivity. So providing the service, providing the location, or providing an accessibility to transportation is going to be a new key value. Flexible. I'd say flexible living is the new variable you need to think about for the aging of the baby boom population. These folks are going to be coming in and out of work, in and out of careers, in and out of marriages, having people visit to, uh, for a short time for rehab, having people move in with them for caregiving over a longer term. We no longer have that, strong, that, that predictable lifespan that our parents had. So we're going to have blended lives and flexible living. As a result, I really think we need to start thinking about the design of the home has got to be more modular, more open, easy to navigate, easy to use. So yeah, all those principles that you've heard about in universal design, but not universally boring. Something that truly excites and delights the customer. With a mind to acoustics to men who can't hear very well after age 50, to a mind for lighting that shows that people over 40 need 20 times more light than they did by at age 20. So things that are big, easy to change, easy to hear, easy to light, but more important than anything else, fun should never leave aging. 
And then lastly, livable communities beyond sunned and sea. The fastest growing place that people want to retire, so-called naturally occurring retirement communities, not the ones that are made from, uh, by design, are places that have the intensity and the density and the accessibility to do the things you want. So the intensity of activities that are around, close enough so that I can walk it, segue it, wheelchair it, and yes, occasionally drive it, but more importantly, that I have the accessibility to be able to get there when I want to. Where are these places? Well, they're off of Houston Street in Greenwich Village, New York. They're in South End of Boston. They're in small rural communities. But do you want to know what the number one is? College communities. And by the way, in the Northeast, I can't pick on anybody's weather. But the, one of the fastest growing communities out there for naturally occurring retirement communities, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Not very well known for its beachfront and not very well known for its sunny skies. But it has the intensity, it has density, and what else do college communities have? Not just the chance to go back to school and multi-generational activities and faces to, to see, but large healthcare systems are often near large uh, uh, universities as well. So as we start thinking about what that community of the future is going to be, yes, it's around the plants and the green and then the like, but it's more importantly around the things that give me a reason to get up in the morning. So in sum, I think the future is looking gray, small, and female. What does that mean for you? I think as we look at an aging population, the house is going to evolve into a platform, not a place, for new places and spaces to enable services. I want you to imagine Geek Squad from Best Buy meets UPS, creating a whole new service provision to bring everything from food to healthcare to technical services into the home. Where do you let this person in? How do they get in? Where do they work? How do they interact? How does the design of what you make contribute to that? Community livability is not going to be just a selling point. It's going to be a demand to have that intensity and density to be able to not just live longer, but to live better. And it's going to be a key driver in real estate choices. And the desire to, unfortunately, from a business perspective, if you're in new construction, the desire to age in place, I believe, is going to remain strong because as the work we've done with the Hartford indicates, that that comfort level, that familiarity level, even if it's a big home, is very compelling, particularly when you put costs on top of that. So new ways to modify, new ways to inform on how to modify the home to be able to age in place, to really get people to realize that an exciting kitchen includes a countertop that you can sit at to cut vegetables so that you can be there for a lifetime when, God forbid, that you're in a wheelchair. Smaller. Small is big challenge to big box stores and big anything. So from the McMansions that many of us have been fond of to the, the Walmart type size store or Target stores, we're not going to be just talking about downsizing. The baby boomers are talking about real sizing. What do I really need and what do I really, quite frankly, feel like putting up with? And as aging becomes a home loan experience, how are we going to be bringing in convenience and providing care? What are the services that I can provide since I'm going to be living alone? You know, if you think about the baby boomers' parents, their mothers on average had 3.8 kids. Does anyone really know how many kids on average the average baby boomer mother had? 1.9. Now, because of immigration, we're holding our population. In fact, we're the only industrialized country in the world that's still growing. So the question I have for you is, in lieu of having an adult daughter or a son who's going to take the time, if you don't have any of those, who's going to provide the care? Where is that care provided? What are the services I'm going to need? And frankly, even the younger population we're seeing after the boomers, they're getting married later, and fewer and fewer of them are having children as well. And then lastly, the feminization of real estate. Additional and extended participation in the workforce is going to mean a house and a location that's going to enable me to work part-time, work from the home, or, do, uh, or to be able to participate as much as possible. Aging does not come without its costs. There's going to be physical demands as well. How do I ensure that I redesign the house or provide maintenance services so that even at 85, I may be able to climb up on a ladder to change a light bulb, but do I really want to be able to do that? An older female fragility and the like is really going to demand not just change in the home, but across everywhere. So retail, work, play environments, the car, and the like. So on that note, to leave some time for questions, my twin brother here, basically, if it's true that one baby boomer is turning um, uh, 65 roughly every seven seconds, that means about 500 of your market just turned 65. Thank you very much.
I was told if we had time for Q&A, and I believe we do, so I'd be happy to take any questions, comments, or bad jokes. Yes? Yes, I actually, for those that got copyrighted, I'll take those out, but I'll be certainly be able to make those available. Um, I'll find out how to do that, but you can also find uh, information on my website that Sandra was so good to uh, talk about, which was uh, agelab.mit.edu. In fact, knowing that I didn't major in marketing, I had to advance that slide. Yes, sir. Yes, I do. Uh, the question was, is that given the, the, the threat and growing threat of identity, and if I get this wrong, I'll go back to you, uh, threat to I, of identity theft, do I believe that these large corporations, or any corporation, frankly, will be able to get into the home to provide these services? I'll answer the privacy question and the fear question with one question back to the audience. Everyone with a credit card in their wallet, please raise your hand. Now that we know what your price is, Essentially, I believe that privacy is a transaction cost, that if the value is great enough around convenience, if it's great enough around care or the like, we will take that risk. Now, will there be more government pressure, as there should be on corporations, to be far more careful with my identity? Absolutely. Will that become a criteria for why I go with one brand versus another? So for instance, with the services I see coming to the house, I think your new strategic partners out there are going to be large affinity groups. I think you're going to find American Express, Blue Cross Blue Shield, the AARPs of the world becoming new service providers that maybe as part of purchasing a home or purchasing a property in a development is, and oh, by the way, you can buy one or two memberships in these large groups that cater to providing care to the diabetics or providing just simple convenience services that are trusted and dependable and affordable. Next question. Yes, sir. In the United States, given our current population, there's not going to be a, a big fall, but you know there'll, there'll be that that drop. I do have uh, um, let's say this on stage it makes me a little nervous. I haven't done the analysis yet. My gut makes me nervous that I should have sold my house a little while ago, because for all of us who did do what we were socialized to do, the American dream to Buy that house, buy the dog, get the 2.5 kids, and that 0.5 kids kind of ugly. Uh, but those two and a half kids uh, in the burbs, or in our case, you know, with the, with the baby boomers, 1.9 kids, uh, and there's a drop behind me, who's going to buy that house? And if you were fortunate enough to buy a more affluent home, it's an even bigger question as to who's going to buy that affluent home. So those communities where we made a pretty good buck and made really nice houses that were not quite the prestige neighborhoods that had the accessibility to the city that you had to essentially sell your first or second born child to afford, those communities I think are going to hurt the most in the next 10, 20, and 30 years. I'll repeat that uh, and, and correct me if I get it off. Uh, the idea that aging in place sounds like a threat, and I believe it is, to the new construction industry. And what are those things that you have to do to try to either navigate that or to provide a compelling case? Um, I think the compelling cases have got to be, one, can you offer more comfort than they have at their home? Uh, second, and this is the hardest part, familiarity. So in other words, the design now has got to be not just in the aesthetic and the usable, but in terms of the psychological. How can I bring in, say, if you grew up and aged in place in New England, New England attributes to wherever it is that you're trying to bring elsewhere. Uh, and then th the other part of it that I really hope I made a strong case for today is that the house is no longer just a house. It's got to be services as well. And it's not going to be the assisted living model that's out there today, which, by the way, people going into assisted living now are upwards of 10 years older than they were before. They're coming in far more frail. So I think assisted living is under threat as much as new construction in general. So the idea of providing services to homes that are out there in the community, and that's going to be as much a competitive characteristic for you as your design, as your price, and your location. And then finally, the community itself. You can't design a development. You know, I grew up in New Jersey, trust me. There's nothing else but developments that I grew up with. 
But on the other hand, the development now has got to be sold in the context of what is the local community that's near me, what's the transportation, what are all the things that I can offer a lifestyle, much the way we said when we had kids. But now the, the challenge for all of us as individuals, but certainly for your industry, is what's the new dream? What's the new lifestyle for life after 50, 60, and 70 years old? And the fact is, we don't know, but it is yet to be written. And one of the things I think you should give yourselves a, a brief break, because you can't wait too long, but aging is really new. We never had a generation live this long, have this much caregiving uh, need, have this much money, even with the hit in the e economy, but with, more importantly, with this high an expectation. Because guess what? The baby boomers have got no brand loyalty at all. And given the divorce rates being initiated by women doubling in the last 10 to 15 years, after age 50, if she's willing to drop him like a hot potato, she's not going to keep you much longer. So the idea is, is, you know, can you be new, can you be exciting, and can you create a lifestyle that they're excited to, and then they'll move to that lifestyle. Yeah, you know, if I thought more about it, and that's why when Sandra gave that elegant uh, intro, that is what I'm needing for me, all of you. I need you to dream a new dream of innovation in what life is going to be like in, quote, the older years. You know, the dream, you can criticize it, and a lot of us made a lot of money out of it, and some are making a lot of money out of criticizing it, of the so-called American dream, the single-family home. And as I said, you know, grew up in New Jersey where Levittown was the, was the norm. Well, you can criticize it, but it worked. What's the new Levittown? What's, what's the, new, the new for the old? There's a question here. Okay. Uh, do I have any feelings about co-housing given the feminization of real estate, single family homes, or you know, living alone and certainly affordability questions? It's, it's an interesting thing. It seems to be developing in small places. You're starting to see it some in Berkeley, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. You're seeing it as kind of a, a nascent development. The only reason why I look at it with a little skepticism is, is that the baby boomers, for all this discussion of trying to define us as 80 million of a group, not only are we aging alone, but frankly, we lived alone as younger people. And I don't mean without our families is that there's a, a book that, if you haven't read it, it's been out for a number of years, I strongly suggest it uh, by another one of those Harvard guys up the river, uh, Robert Putnam, called Bowling Alone. And the argument that he said is that we have a lot less social capital than our parents did. Now, I'll translate the social capital language. We don't join Rotary Club. We don't go to PTA as much. And the fact is, is our parents belong to bowling leagues. How many of you guys joined a bowling league lately? And the fact is, is that we were not very good at making good friends in our younger years, especially with women going to work. That means that both, gender, both genders were at the workplace and did not make those close-knit relationships with the neighbor next door. So I'm skeptical that co-housing will work as well if we don't have people that you're essentially making a social contract with saying, hey, we're 60-something, this is a great idea, but by the way, when I'm 90, I'll change my diapers. Yeah, nat natural for villages. Question? Implications for race and ethnicity. A lot of what I showed you is the mainstream. It tends to be for the middle class to more affluent trend. There's a huge difference with Hispanic population, although you might be surprised, African American population, more African American women live alone than Caucasian white women in the United States. But Hispanic population and Asian population are still in caregiving mode and living in large groups. Caveat, as income and education goes up, they come, become far more likely like the data I showed you. So I'll give you an example. Let's go to China today. And we all talk about, gee, can't we take care of our parents the way you know, the, the Chinese or Asian culture takes care of their parents? Do you know that the Chinese government is actually considering it, making it a law that you have to visit your parents once a month? because elder care now has become such a crisis there with one child, one family policy where there's a shortage of children, but also parents being good parents told their kids, go get a job, go do something else. And by the way, go do it in the city where the opportunities are. So as a result now, we're finding that caregiving and close-knit families and large families for lower income strata still hold, but as that group grows up and has more money, 
it does not. There's a question, yes, ma'am. So, so essentially the sun became an income stream more than anything else. Yeah, I have an 18-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old daughter. I'm still waiting for the return on investment. I don't quite see it yet. So. I think we're down to 13 seconds. Thank you very much. You've been a delight. Good luck.